warm this afternoon. So, uh, great to be together. I'd like to welcome uh, those people who are also joining us uh, via Periscope. I think, Rick, do I have these numbers correctly? Last week, did we have 40 people join us, view yes. us on Periscope? 40 people viewed, and then we had another four views after the service. So 40 joined us live on Periscope, and four joined us afterwards. We welcome those people who will be watching a recorded service, either via Facebook or YouTube or our website. Many people to welcome to, uh, to join with us in worship. We acknowledge with respect the land on which we gather. We acknowledge the creator and the creative energy that brought forth creation in its beginning. We honor the fact that as human beings we've been given the responsibility to be caretakers for creation. We acknowledge the traditional territories of the New Chalman First Nations peoples. Nishokish Sobak. Everything is one. Everything is one. Even though Mike is not here, his voice will lead us in the welcome prayer. I can't shoot the nuns. Creator, guide me through my day. Creator, guide me through my day. We we katha. We we katha. My is Lucas. My is Lucas. Keep my family well. Keep my family well. We shaha. We shaha. Suk nayeth. Suk nayeth. Watch over my health. Watch over my health. Wasuk aha. Wasuk aha. Protect my surroundings. Protect my surroundings. Chew. Amen. I think there are a couple of people who have some announcements. Do you have the microphone there? No, we're right here. It's good. Okay. Just be careful uh, for people who are walking out to the front and as you uh, leave uh, this week, you'll see that the the First Nations carpet's been installed and is ready for the First Nations Cultural Week uh, family camp and it has some beautiful images, but just so you know, there's, it's a little raised edge, just don't trip. Good morning, I'm Judy, and this morning I wish to extend a huge thank you to everyone who attended the church picnic, provided the food, organized the games, and cleaned up. Your time and talents are appreciated. My second thank you goes to all of you who helped make our happy times the special event it was. All of you who set up, took down, provided the delicious food, served and welcomed our many guests. Thank you. The third thank you goes to those of you who used the kitchen and took the time and an effort to make sure it is left clean tidy and spotless. We made it through another inspection, which happens just whenever. <laughs> it would be terrible if we lost our reading in the kitchen. So thank you to everyone who takes that time and effort. Good morning, I'm Angie. Um, what I'm really going to tell you is that really exciting news for July 8th and 9th. That, um, there's a charity golf club that, that they're having a, uh, for four charities. And they originally had 11 apply for it, and four of us got chosen. One is the Bread of Life that we support here. The other one is Kids Sports. And uh, the, um, uh, oh, help me, somebody. The shelter? Was the shelter on? Uh, and the Alberni Valley um, Echo and Fur Park Foundation that I sit on too. And there's a fourth The Arts one. Council. Pardon me? Is it the Arts Council? Oh, the Arts Council. 
the biggest one. <laughs> that I miss. And and also the charity for uh, children, the variety club. So they're Last year, I understand, they managed to raise that each one got close to $10,000, so that's a lot of money. But it needs everybody's support. And what I'm asking you people to do is on if you have any time on July the 8th and 9th, come out and visit us. There are um, close to 200 items to bid on, silent auction, lots of fun things to see and socialize, have a drink, have uh, dinner, lunch, and bring friends out there. You do not have to belong to the uh, Alberni Golf Club, just come out and enjoy yourself. And so I understand there's lots of people that go out there and uh, do some of their Christmas shopping. So that's a hint for you to get out there because they need people like you to uh, come out and check out what there is to put your name on. So. Please come out. Um, the other thing that I'm here to tell you, that I hope that everyone took this sheet, and it's all the dates and stuff. We have um, Minnie that is leaving for three months, and we want to wish her well on her endeavors for the next three months, and I know that uh, some of us will really miss her not being around here. But we definitely want to wish you well, Minnie, and have fun in your new endeavors. <laughs> anyway, let's let's give her a hand to <laughs> So take this sheet, write the uh, days that people are away, and especially Ellen and Andrea, so that you're not expect that when you come here, you're not expecting. Them. This is a good Thing to put on your calendar. Thank you again. My name is Dennis. I just had a question for the uh, 42 people watching on Periscope. Could you please tell me what submarine you're, you're with?
Yes, she will? Okay, perfect. Yes, more back here. Great. I had one on Tuesday. We had one on Tuesday. Great celebration. Yep. My mom's second Mom's? Madonna's birthday, turning 70. Now we've got that recorded. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> Will she love us? <laughs> Anybody else? Any other group? Oh, anniversary. Uh, July the 60th, and my 53rd anniversary. 53rd anniversary coming up. Any other anniversaries? No, let's sing.
please be seated. I invite the young and the young at heart to come and gather around the story box if you like for a story. Or stay where you are if you're more comfortable there too. There might be one or two people. Oh, hello. How are you today? Want to come and sit on this beautiful story box? Look how gorgeous it is today. Gerald was a tall giraffe whose neck was long and slim, but his knees were awfully crooked and his legs were rather thin. Can you all see it by the pictures up there? He was very good at standing still and munching shoots off trees. But when he tried to run around, he buckled at the knees. What happened to him? Oh my goodness, his chin must have hurt. Now, every year in Africa, they hold a jungle dance where every single animal turns up to skip and prance. And this year, when the day arrived, poor Gerald felt so sad because when it came to dancing, he was re really very bad. The warthogs started waltzing, and the rhinos rocked and rolled. The lions danced a tango. That was elegant and old. Oh my goodness. The chimps all did the cha-cha-cha with a very Latin feel. And eight baboons then teamed up for a splendid Scottish wheel. Gerald swallowed bravely and he walked toward the floor, but the lion saw him coming and they began to roar. Hey, look at clumsy Gerald, the animals all sneered. Giraffes can't dance, you silly fool. Oh, Gerald, you're so weird. Oh, Gerald. Gerald simply froze. He was rooted in the spot. They're right, he thought. I'm useless. Well, I feel like such a clock. So he crept off from the dance floor and he started walking home. He'd never felt so sad before, so sad and so alone. Then he found a little clearing and he looked up to the sky. The moon can be so beautiful, he whispered with a sigh. Excuse me, coughed the cricket, who'd seen Gerald earlier. But sometimes when you're different, you just need a different song, said the cricket. The cricket must have had a little yellow voice, right? And sometimes when you're different, you just need to sing a different song. Look at them. Listen to the swaying grass and listen to the trees. To me, the sweetest music is in those branches in the breeze. The cricket's whispering into his ears. So imagine that lovely moon is playing just for you. Everything makes music if you really want it to. With that cricket, oh sorry, with that, the cricket smiled and picked up his violin. Then Gerald felt his body do the most amazing thing. His hooves started shuffling, making circles on the ground. His neck was gently swaying and his tail was 
solution ground. Well, that kind of failed swoosh. He threw his legs out sideways, and he swung them everywhere. Then he did a backward somersault and left them. Gerald felt so wonderful, his mouth was open wide. I'm dancing! Yes, I'm dancing! I am dancing! Gerald cried. Is he happy? Yes, I'm happy now. Then one by one, each animal who'd been there at the dance arrived while Gerald boogie and watched him quite in a trance. They shouted, it's a miracle! We must be in a dream. Gerald's the best dancer we've ever seen. <laughs> how did you learn to dance like that? Please, Gerald, tell us how. But Gerald swiftly twirled around and finished with a bow. See, look at his bow. What did you think? Two flowers. Oh. Then he raised his head and looked up at the moon and the stars above. We all can dance, he said, when we find music that we love. What did Gerald need to find before he could dance? What helped him find a way to dance? Music that he loved, that he just started swaying. Yeah. Everybody. There's the picture. What picture is that one? He's looking up at the stars above. Yeah, that's so, a picture too. It is a picture too. That's right.
Fifty men of the company of prophets also went, and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and rolled it up, and struck the water. The water was parted to the one side and to the other, until, until the two of them crossed on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you, Elisha said. Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. He responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted to you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. He picked up the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle of Elijah that had fallen from him and struck the water, saying, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? When he had struck the water, the water was parted to one side and to the other, and Elijah went over. The responsive psalm is Psalm uh, 77, uh, Voices United 791. Ellen, would you play the refrain for us, please? Just as the free spirit is incompatible with selfishness. 
These two ways of life are antithetical, so that you cannot give at times one way and at times another way according to how you feel on any given day. Why don't you choose to be led by the Spirit and so escape the erratic compulsions of a law-dominated existence? It is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival, uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions, ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I have warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit God's kingdom. But what happens when we live God's way? He brings gifts into our lives, much the same way that fruit appears in an orchard. Things like affection for others, exuberance about life, serenity. We develop a willingness to stick with things, a sense of compassion in the heart, and a conviction that a basic holiness permeates things and people. We find ourselves involved in loyal commitments, not needing to force our way in life, able to marshal and direct our energies wisely. Legalism is helpless in bringing this about. It only gets in the way. Among those who belong to Christ, everything connected with getting our own way and mindlessly responding to what everyone else calls necessities is killed off for good. Crucified. Since this is the kind of life we have chosen, the life of the Spirit, let us make sure that we do not just hold it as an idea in our heads or a sentiment in our hearts, but work out its implications in every detail of our lives. That means we will not compare ourselves with each other, as if one of us were better and another worse. We have far more interesting things to do with our lives. Each of us is an original. The Gospel reading is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, verses 51 to 62. A Samaritan village refuses to receive Jesus. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him, because his face was set towards Jerusalem. When his disciple James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them. Then they went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. May we listen to what the Spirit is saying. Amen. Thank you, Carol. We rise to sing, I am the Lord of the sea and the sky.
May the words of Amana and the meditations of all of our hearts set together be your word of the truth meditated on and spoken to you. In the name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. Amen. Keep your eyes on the road because when, <clears throat> when you don't, the results are tragic. We know this to be true, don't we? Just by remembering accident <coughs> reports that we might have heard of, of things that have happened while people have been texting and driving, or any other kind of distracted driving, for that matter. It only takes a second of an averted eye, and something tragic could happen. Sometimes it's not just anything tragic, it's just that we notice that the steering wheel has just gone a little bit one way or the other, right? and we do a correction. And sometimes it's more tragic than that. And so too with spirituality. Where we fix our eyes is equally important. There are many distractions from the Jesus way. As Paul was very clear in that reading from Galatians, thank you Carol, the readings were a little long today. Thank you for, for reading them all so well. Paul, um, in that uh, portion of of the letter to the Galatians is being strong and firm and determined. He's been teaching them and they haven't quite got it yet. So he thought it was time to be explicit. And Carol was reading from a contemporary translation by uh, uh, The Message, which uses language that maybe sometimes we're a little bit unfamiliar with, so it can almost jar us a little bit. That's uh, the translator's way of making sure we're not complacent, which is very Paul-like. So, uh, Paul is raising up this, uh, the spirit, the way of the spirit, to, for people to live into this uh, spirit-filled way. And so there are many distractions, is what Paul might be saying, from the way of Jesus, the way of compassion, the way of nonviolence. So keep your eyes on Jesus in today's text, in the story from Luke in particular, as he sets his face to Jerusalem. His head is averted as he looks ahead, just as we do when we're looking to the future. That future might be something that's going to be happening tomorrow or further in our lives as a future. We look there with determination, setting our eyes perhaps on a dream with unreserved de determination. Jesus has a firm resolve, a determination, a serious conviction. He knows the cost of heading towards Jerusalem. He understands. Jesus was one brilliant mind person, perhaps a genius in his own time. So we can be assured that he had analyzed his every action in accordance with his mission and listened to God in his relationship with God as he turned to face Jerusalem. There's no turning back now. You know that point in your life where you know there's no turning back? You know that conviction or a career shift, perhaps? Or a calling to be involved in writing some inequity or some injustice, and you move in, and you know there's no turning back. You've stepped into something important. Or a mission that just needs doing because it needs doing. That's why many of us are involved in not-for-profits. It's a, an important mission, and it needs doing it. I've got some skills so I can help here. Or a moment when you change, where there's a shift, and you move from that not knowing what the next step is going to be, having no clear idea at all to that place of being absolutely clear. This is the next step in my life absolutely clear and something in the core of your being shifts because that clarity has come and you move in that direction. You take your GPS out actually and you start moving because that's when it can actually give you some guidance. 
you're not moving, it doesn't move either. The other wonders of the technology, this uh, yesterday actually, I joined with 900 other people via live stream, joining 2,000 gathered, people gathered in Indianapolis to listen to the Dalai Lama speak. I felt like I was there. I hope that's how people feel when they join us by Periscope or any of these other wonderful means that the team up there is uh, doing something that I don't understand. I hope people feel like they're actually here and part of our community. Because as the 81-year-old Dalai Lama walked on stage, I could tell. Maybe some of you joined by live stream too. I could tell that this aged person's body hurt. You know how you could tell that, how somebody walks? and yet you would never know it by their face. He was as shiny as ever. At least that's how I see him. And his joy was present. His joy just seems to bubble out of him at the absolute perfect time. I don't know how he managed to be this joyful, abundant person when he's living with 60 years plus of exile from his home and country. His message, his resolve, his determination is like Jesus as Jesus sets his face to Jerusalem. Jesus step by step walking in the way of nonviolence. We know the end point, the cross. Jesus is going to fail and he's going to fail massively. And one of the things we know as Christians, that one of the teachings that we can offer to the world is we know about failure, and we know how to get back up again. We know how to pick up the pieces of whatever that failure was, and our theology calls it resurrection, and go again. Because we have a hope in mind. When the Dalai Lama steps on stage, he speaks with authenticity. I think Jesus spoke with that authenticity. An authenticity that comes from that 60 years plus of exile and 60 years and more of what he calls warm-hearted practice. Practicing warm-heartedness day in and day out, also known as compassion. And when the, oops, I just gave this next one away. And when the Dalai Lama speaks, we can be assured that he's going to talk about what? And yesterday, he did not disappoint his audience. Hope, he says, lies in, the, in education about compassion. By the end of the 21st century, he said, the world could be different. The world could be more peaceful if we make education about compassion our priority. And with a little bit of mischievousness in his voice, he went on from there. And he said, there are 7 billion people on the planet, and about 6 billion of those people, his figures, not mine, are part of some kind of religious tradition. And amongst those 6 billion people, there are a few who do mischievous things. And there are a few who are troublemakers. Now here's where I add a few words to what the Dalai Lama said. My words, not his. And our problem is that we focus on those few. The news is full of those few troublemakers. Out of six billion religious tradition people, there are a few troublemakers. They do a lot of damage. I'm not saying they don't. But if we just stop focusing on them, we'd see how many are troublemakers. All of the world religions, the Dalai Lama said, at their core, have the same purpose. You've heard this. The same goal, which is, he says, love, tolerance, forgiveness. And they all have practices of self-discipline to work on their purpose. Compassion. Six billion people, give or take a few troublemakers, all want the same thing. What he thinks.
things is lacking in the religious and the non-religious is a deep down lack of serious conviction and commitment to compassion, to learn, to understand, to practice, to say with the depth of our being that compassion can be learned. It's not a gift of few. It's not, you know, Mother Teresa's gift that she has some um, been endowed with by, you know, uh, by faith, although I'm sure she was. It's something that everyone can learn. The scientific community, he says, through analysis, says that by our human, our human nature is more compassionate than anything else. It's more compassionate than it is competitive. It's more compassionate than it is violent or evil. It's more compassionate than any other creature. So then he adds that this gives him hope. That he can put his hope in if we focus on compassion, then there can be more peace in the world by the end of the 21st century. And then he gets a little bit provocative just to stir up us religious kind of folk. He says, prayers will not bring about peace. Peace will not come, peace will only come through action. It will not come by praying to Buddha or the Christ. Don't pray to God for peace. We human beings created violence. We human beings are responsible to create peace. And loving kindness is the source of that peace. We need to be motivated by warm-heartedness. <coughs> So what do you think that Jesus was motivated by when he turned his face to Jerusalem? Compassion. Compassion. Every step of his journey, he's teaching about love and forgiveness and tolerance, which can be equated to compassion. Or some people say it's his walk of nonviolence. And as I thought about that in light of uh, listening to the Dalai Lama, I thought I had a bit of a proud glint in my eye about this community of faith. Because we focus on com compassion all of the time. Our caring for one another, compassion. Our commitment to the charter of compassion that we have hanging in windows places. Our use of the appreciative way perspective and paradigm, looking for solutions for the positive, for lifting each other up, for affirming each other and not blaming. Even our pinch crunch model of how we want to be in relationship with one another, to go to one another, it's about compassion and cooperation. We study other religious traditions to understand. We study peace. We're an affirming and welcoming congregation, a space where everyone is welcome, and we know that we don't get it right all the time. We have no illusion about that at all. Well, maybe you do. I don't, because I don't get it right all the time, ever. But I know how to pick myself up, and so does this community of faith. And we know how to set before us what we believe is our call for now and to walk and to live into that. Education systems, as I speak with the teachers, <clears throat> uh, focuses on <coughs> compassion as well. And <coughs> things like empathy training, self-regulation, red light, green light. Mike talks to me about red light, green light. And there's amber light in there too. Random acts of kindness, creating cultures of kindness. Social emotional learning. And the teachers in, in the midst can add more to that, which I think are ways in which we're teaching about compassion. And as Jesus sets his, his face to Jerusalem, it's a little unfortunate, and it's a really my strong recommendation that you look at him and not his disciples, because they're rather like Rambo disciples. They want to bring down fire from heaven 
on those Samaritans that are a lot more like Denzel Washington, plays the character of John Creasy in a movie called Man on Fire, which is very violent, and so if you're adverse to violence, I don't recommend you watch it. <clears throat> However, it's an interesting story that is really a story about redemption in the end. But when a nine-year-old girl is kidnapped and thought to be murdered, Denzel Washington moves into pure vengeance and retribution. That's close to where the disciples were at. These Samaritans didn't welcome Jesus. And they remembered the stories, the old stories of Elijah, when the king of Samaria did not welcome Elijah or Elijah's God. Elijah brought down fire from heaven and had them all killed. One of our Old Testament stories are really, really harsh. And Jesus says, no, that is not the way. That is not the spirit that I'm bringing to you. If you think that's what I will do, you have not understood the spirit of the Son of Man. That's what some of the ancient texts add in to the Gospel lesson, which has since been taken out because they're not sure if it's authentically Jesus' words that they've been removed. However, the very old texts of the Vulgate and the Septuagint have those words put on Jesus' lips. Doesn't really matter whether he said them or not. What matters is that that was his teaching. That I think that he understood that the Samaritans had learned and had been treated with violence for years and years and years. And it was going to take some time for them to understand, for them to even begin to trust Jesus' message. That the salvation that he talked about, this wholeness and health and well-being and harmony was for everyone. And no one was excluded. And it was for the Samaritans as well. As Christians, our purpose is to live into that spirit of compassion. To analyze it, to understand it. To keep our eyes on Jesus. To place our trust in his way. Love, generosity, forgiveness, tolerance. Not keep our eyes so focused on the evening news that we miss the promise. That if we keep steadfastly our eyes on these ways of compassion, we will change the world. Paul says, be who in baptism you already are. He never said, behave <clears throat> so God will save you. He always said, God has saved you already. Paul uses this terminology of which he calls in most translations, works of the flesh and fruits of the spirit. Well, I decided that I'd take the liberty to change those, those terminologies. And instead of, uh, for the 21st century, uh, instead of works of the flesh, take his list and think of it as qualities of the way of violence. Read that list that he names over again. And tell me if there's one of them there that doesn't have something to do with doing violence to another person or yourself. And take the, the other list that Paul calls the fruits of the Spirit and name them qualities of the ways of <coughs> compassion. Those qualities are love, joy, peace, patience, faithfulness, goodness, kindness, gentleness, self-control, to which I added creativity. These qualities are what we hope to nurture in our life. And this, Paul gives us this, uh, this, these two lists which then form a spiritual discipline of um, sort of self-discipline. 
as if on a daily basis you take those two lists, or even just the one, the ways of compassion or the fruits of the Spirit. And you put that, those words on a piece of paper and you just hold it up and you ask yourself as you do a review of the day before you go off to sleep, how and when did I offer these qualities of compassion today? <clears throat> those spiritual reviews of the day are really important to keep growing our awareness. Or otherwise we risk turning into one of those Rambo-like disciples unawares. Jesus doesn't pull any punches in the Gospel text. He doesn't ask for much. He just asks for your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's no one. That's all he asks for. And the rest of the Gospel, that's it. it's his way of saying to those who quickly say, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you. And he says, are you sure? This is what it's going to mean. I don't have a home. I am homeless. I have no place to put my head. I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to make a big mistake. They're going to crucify me. Are you sure you want to come? No, you have to leave your family behind. I'm teaching a new way. Are you sure you want to come? It's going to cost you. You know, he's pretty clear about that. In other passages, he's also very clear. The joy of this way is beyond what you can imagine. And it's the way of peace. I know no other way, he says. I know no other way for peace. Amen. Let us rise to say, put peace into each other's hands. <laughs>
God and nurturer of spiritual fruit. Help us as the seed of the Spirit ripens in us. Now just to root ourselves daily in compassion. Encourage us to meditate on love and to be ready to be Christ's words and actions. Help us respond to others with kindness, to be warm-hearted, and may our gentleness be evident to all. Let the light of Christ shine in our lives. Keep us in step with the Spirit. Keep us able to love one another. God, we bring into the presence of this loving community, into the presence of Jesus the Christ, who promises to be with us, our prayers for particular people and situations. I invite you to name those people and situations aloud as you are comfortable. Pray for the upcoming First Nations Cultural Week Camp, and it will be a blessing to all who attend. That everyone will grow in understanding, build relationships, and have fun. God in community, holy in three in one. Set us free to be your servants. <coughs> and we pray as Jesus taught us, singing.
offer. May they serve your name. May they be used to grow compassion in this community and farther afield. May we be blessed by the spirit of compassion that fills us and motivates us in our daily living as we meet and greet people in community. May our faces shine with the love of Christ. Amen. Our closing hymn is How Great Thou Art, verses 1 and 2. Thank you. 